welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Chanel Cleeton. And she's here to share with us her new historical fiction, Our Last Days in Barcelona. Now, Chanel is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of Reese Witherspoon's book club pick, Next Year in Havana, When We Left Cuba, The Last Train to Key West, and The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba. Originally from Florida, Chanel grew up on the stories of her family's exodus from Cuba, following the events of the Cuban Revolution. Her passion for politics and history continued during her years spent studying in England, where she earned a bachelor's degree in international relations from Richmond, the American International University in London, and a master's degree in global politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Chanel also received her JD from the University of South Carolina School of Law. So let's welcome to the show, Chanel Cleeton. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh my goodness. You know, once I picked up your book, I could not put it down. And I, and I know you're getting that from everybody. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear that. That's one of the things as an author, you know, we hope that readers enjoy our books and find themselves immersed in the story. So that means so much. Thank you. Of course, my goodness. Well, and so what inspired you to write this book? Because it's just so fascinating. Oh, well, thank you. So I, I really have to give the credit to my readers. You know, I first introduced the Perez family when I wrote Next Year in Havana, and that came out in 2018. And the the main family in the book has several sisters. And I had written one of the sister stories, Elisa, in Next Year in Havana, and then Beatrice's story in When We Left Cuba. And once I finished When We Left Cuba, I really thought that was kind of it for the sisters. There were two other sisters, but I didn't have a story in mind for them. And I just kept getting uh, notes and, and letters from my readers asking me if I would tell the other sisters' stories. And I was so inspired by the passion that they've had for this family and the support that the readers have shown these books. And so, you know, as, as soon as I started thinking about it, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I ended up deciding to write Isabel's story um, in Our Last Days in Barcelona. And it felt like kind of a natural place to pick up. Her story was where When We Left Cuba ended off. Um, which was, like I said, her sister Beatrice's story. So we pick up in the 1960s, but then we also go back in time and learn a bit more about the matriarch of the family, um, their mother, Alicia, who's always kind of been um, sort of a background figure in the family, but very influential. And I wanted my readers to get kind of a glimpse of, you know, what made her the character that she is and to understand better some of her life experiences as well. Do you think that they'll be asking for a another book to come? Because I mean, my goodness, you've had so many great books in this series. I, I'm so grateful for for the support they've given all the books. You know, I try to write all of them as kind of a place where a new reader could jump in at any point. So we kind of have traversed history at, at different moments with this family. Um, and it follows sort of different family members and connections. Um, but there is one sister left, Maria. And while I don't have a plan right now for her story, um, I'm definitely seeing some some questions about if she'll be um, getting a story down the road. So it's something I sort of have in the back of my mind and we'll see if we revisit it in the future. So what is Our Last Days in Barcelona about? Sure. So Our Last Days in Barcelona is the story of Isabel Perez and she was exiled from Cuba after the, the Cuban revolution and she's found herself in Palm Beach in the 1960s. And her sister Beatrice disappears in Barcelona. Beatrice has been working with um, the CIA on some of the efforts to, um, to remove Castro from power. And so she disappears under kind of circumstances where the family's worried about her and Isabel goes in search of her. And while she's there, Isabel kind of embarks on this unforgettable journey where she really um, discovers a lot about herself, but also um, uncovers a family mystery that goes back to the 1930s about their mother, Alicia. So the other part of the book is traveling back to the beginning of the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona and their mother, Alicia, has traveled from Cuba and is there, um, and her story sort of intertwines with that of a cousin that is in Cuba during the 1930s. So you really get to kind of look at Cuban and Spanish relations um, through the lens of this family and, you know, the impacts that war and exile has had on them. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, did you ever have the opportunity to travel to Cuba or Spain? So I was fortunate with this book. I pitched the idea to my editor and agent 
I want to say in like February of 2020. Um, so obviously right before the world kind of shut down um, with COVID. And so I had planned a specific research trip for this book to go to Spain. Um, but obviously, you know, with COVID, everything kind of changed and there would be like little moments where things would get better. And I would think, okay, maybe, you know, I can try to do this, but it just didn't, you know, it never, it wor- never worked out, but I had been before. So I was really able to kind of, um, put some of those experiences into the book. Um, not a big spoiler, but the characters go to Marbella at one point, and that's, you know, somewhere I've spent time in, in Spain. So it was nice to have that. But I will say, you know, the funny thing with historical fiction is that even if you've gone somewhere, you know, in, in real time, it often is almost confusing because things have changed so much, you know, place names change, street names change when you're going this far into the past. And, you know, anecdotally with the Marbella example, there was a a marina in a little town that I'd visited and I put it in one of the drafts of the book thinking like, of course that would have been there in the 1960s. And then luckily in copy edits, you know, just managed to catch the fact that, oh no, it it actually was founded like seven years later than I needed it to be for the book. So, you know, often you run into that when you're, you're writing historical fiction, but that's kind of one of the fun parts. And, And thankfully the internet, and there's so many resources out there that you can use to kind of recreate your character steps in the past. When you were doing your research, I mean, that's a fascinating, you know, tip there because a lot of people don't think about, oh, maybe landscapes change and we've got Mm -hmm. to really take that into consideration. When you were doing your research for the book, was there anything that really surprised you? You know, I was really intrigued um, by exploring kind of this relationship with Cuba and Spain. Um, You know, part of the idea from the book came as well while I was researching my previous novel, which was The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba, And that book was set um, during the Cuban fight for independence from Spain at the end of the 19th century. And so I was really immersed in this very um, violent and contentious conflict, you know, in this brutal fight for independence that they went through in Cuba. And when I was, you know, reading all this, I just came across this mention of how many Cubans actually traveled to Spain during the Spanish Civil War to fight on the Republican side, and also how much support was going on inside of Cuba in terms of fundraising and kind of efforts to to support the war effort in Spain. And I was really struck by the fact that, you know, that is kind of a a short time frame to go from being, you know, such um, bitter enemies fighting for independence, and then to have people volunteering to to go overseas to fight in this conflict. And, you know, I'm Cuban American, a lot of my family's kind of distant answer ancestry is Spanish. Um, You know, they came to Cuba from Spain. And so I I was very interested about that relationship and kind of understanding that better. Um, And it felt in a way, almost like a continuation of of the research I'd done and the story I was telling with the most beautiful girl in Cuba to look at how that relationship had evolved generationally. And the cousin that I mentioned earlier in the book is actually a descendant of one of the heroines in the most beautiful girl in Cuba. So it was kind of nice to, to pick up that thread as well. I found it fascinating how you interwove all of that in, especially the piece about a woman that's involved in espionage. Because, I mean, so much has changed, but women didn't really have a whole lot of opportunities back then. Well, I think, you know, the CIA, especially in that time period, um, definitely was kind of working with civilians um, and people who had connections. And, you know, with Castro, obviously, we saw like a history of them trying to use women to to get time for assassination attempts. So it felt like a natural fit um, in that moment in history and, and some of the CIA's efforts um, to have characters involved in that. You know, there were many women that were involved in kind of the fight for Cuban after the revolution, the fight against Castro and against the regime. Um, and so I wanted to, to honor that spirit and, you know, the women who were so dedicated to to Cuba after the revolution and during the revolution, quite frankly. So when you're writing this book, did the characters seem just to write themselves or was this something you had planned out? You know, all of my books really surprised me and and my characters always do as well. You know, I kind of went into this book with a bit of a history with the characters because they had sort of shown up as as minor characters in the previous novels. But really, you know, I had to kind of get to know them in a different way, you know, as as their own entities, independent of the lens that I was seeing them through when I was writing from their siblings' perspectives. So that was definitely um, an interesting challenge, I think, in the beginning to, to feel like they were speaking to me enough that I could really feel like I was kind of slipping into their minds and, and being able to, to get their characters out on the page the way that I wanted. 
But, you know, with every book, it's like you kind of get to that point where things start to click. And I felt that like once the doors opened, um, I really had a, a handle on what made them tick. And, you know, the things that maybe their their siblings might have seen as, as being flaws that were really strengths um, when you kind of looked at it a different way. And I think a big part of that was connecting Isabel's story with her mother's um, because her mother really is such a formative influence in her life. And once I really realized that, you know, this generational story um, needed that counterpoint to to, to help Isabel evolve and to kind of understand where she was coming from, it, it really helped me to embrace her character fully. And really, you know, I went from kind of being reluctant to, to writing her story to um, finding that she was really one of my favorite characters in the family. You know, I just fell in love with sort of her courage and her conviction and, and the loyalty that she has to the people that she loves. It sounds like you're really connected with the characters. Did you ever get a time where something happened and you're like, okay, I'm going to have to leave this and come back and address this later. Definitely. I mean, the, the editorial process is always huge for me. I've, I'm so fortunate. I've worked with my editor now for I think about eight years. Um, and so she and I have a really great working relationship. And she's really wonderful at kind of pointing out things that might not work, making suggestions. We do a lot of brainstorming together with my books. Um, so I found that the book definitely evolved quite a bit of, in edits. And that's usually pretty normal for me, just in that sort of collaborative process. It just helps me to kind of step back and see it from a fresh perspective. Often when you're drafting, you're so in the story that you can miss things. But when you kind of look at it with a more critical editorial eye and have that input coming in, I think it helps a lot to, to shape the story. Now, were there family and society expectations that you interwove in your book? You know, one thing that has definitely kind of been a common theme with this family coming from, you know, next year in Havana is obviously the weight of exile. You know, I, I don't want to give too much away in terms of spoilers for those who maybe haven't read the read the earlier books, but the family's been through, you know, tremendous trauma and, and great loss um, following the, the revolution in Cuba and then their exile to the United States. And so they're all really grappling with that in different ways. And, and we see that coming out in the characters' kind of different personalities, you know, like all siblings, they, they each have their own personality and the way that they've handled exile and what they've been through. And for Isabel, you know, really it's it's kind of, she is the one that as the eldest is expected to sort of do what the family needs her to do. You know, her siblings are a bit more rebellious. And so that, that weight of expectation of kind of keeping it all together has been on her shoulders. And in our last days in Barcelona, we really see those cracks forming and the fact that she's been sort of living her life for other people and for societal expectations and, and what it means to be a Perez woman, you know, in her family's eyes. And, and we understand how that's shaped through the mother's experiences and, you know, how she's kind of passed those expectations on to her daughters based on what happens to her in the past. But for Isabel, it's really about kind of finding her voice in the story and finding what kind kind of, of person she wants to be independent of all the, the expectations and, and coming to grips with sort of all of she's lost and how she's going to forge a future for herself, you know, now that she's been forced to leave her home and she's lost so much. Well, I really enjoyed your book. That was a great read. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work? Thank you so much. I have a website, www.chanelcleeton.com, where I have, um, you know, book discussion questions, um, you know, little teasers from the books, things that kind of are, are meant to supplement the reading experience, especially if you're with the book club and, and you want to read this with your book club. Um, there's lots of great book club kits on my website that you can check out as well. Well, it's been a delightful discussion, Chanel. Thank you for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Chanel. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Our Last Days in Barcelona. Our Last Days in Barcelona is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. If you don't see it on the shelf, ask for them to order it. Again, if you'd like to connect with Chanel, you can at her website, chanelcleeton.com, for more information on not just this book, but all of her great other award-winning books. Well, we're going to pause here for a quick moment, and we'll be right back after this message. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. 
His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.